my name is uh, Victor Cha. I'm a um, senior advisor and career chair here at CSIS, as well as a uh, professor at Georgetown University. And we're very fortunate today to uh, have a topic of very timely discussion, Korea's interest in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And we have really an all-star cast uh, to talk about this today. Um, before I go further, I, uh, I've been instructed here to do a couple of things. The first thing I want to do is um, welcome you all to the new building. Uh, for those of you who haven't been here before, this has been long in the making uh, 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 by John Hamry. And um, I don't know if some of you noticed, but we have a global chandelier out there in the back that uh, was very expensive. Uh, but one of the things that it does is it um, flashes lights uh, according to geographic themes. And for today, this morning, uh, if you stand under it, you will see that it uh, displays a, uh, uh, a lighting pattern that is a figure of the Korean Peninsula. Is that right? Yeah, oh, yeah. so, so. Um, money yeah. well spent. Right, money <laughs> well, well spent. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, but again, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you all here today. Let me um, uh, properly introduce our, our three speakers. Um, Ambassador An, An Ho Young, is, as you know, the um, um, Republic of Korea's ambassador here in the United States. He joined the foreign ministry in 1978 and has held a number of postings throughout his career, most recently as first vice minister of foreign affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, prior to this, Ambassador An served as Korea's ambassador to Belgium and as head of the Korean mission to the European Union. He was appointed deputy minister for trade at the ministry from 2008 to 2011, during which he also was the president Serpa for the G20 and G8 outreach meetings. Uh, he has served as director general of the Multilateral Trade Bureau and as director of the International Trade Law Division in the office of the Minister of Trade and he was Director General of the Economic Cooperation Bureau at the Ministry of Finance and Economy from 2004 to 2006. Uh, he's also been a professor uh, and is a graduate of Seoul National University, as well as the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. Um, <clears throat> Wendy Cutler became act Acting Deputy U.S. Trade Representative in June of 2013. She is responsible for U.S. trade negotiations and enforcement in Asia and Africa. Her specific responsibilities include the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the U.S.-China Joint Commission on Commerce and Trade, JCCT, uh, the Asia-Pacific Asia Economic Cooperation Forum, U.S.-India Trade Policy Forum, and Trade and Investment Framework Agreements. She also directly oversees engagement with Japan in the TPP as well as in the bilateral negotiations with Japan parallel to the TPP. Um, Wendy joined USTR in 1988 and over the past 25 years has held num a number of positions working on both bilateral and multilateral issues. Most recently, she led the US-Japan TPP consultations. Uh, as many of you know, she was chief US negotiator for CHORUS and was the lead US official for US trade and investment agenda in APEC. Prior to joining USTR, um, Wendy worked on trade issues at the Commerce Department. She received her MSFS degree from Georgetown, so there's a slight bias in terms of our presenters today, <laughs> uh, as well as her BA from George Washington University. Um, Scott Miller is a senior advisor and holds the William M. Scholl Chair in International Business at CSIS. From 1997 to 2012, he was Director for Global Trade Policy at Procter & Gamble. In that position, he was responsible for the full range of international trade, investment, and business, facil business facilitation issues for the company. He's led many campaigns supporting U.S. free trade agreements, and as a member of numerous business associations, he has been a key contributor to international trade and investment policy. He advised the U.S. government as liaison to the U.S. Trade Representatives Advisory Committee on Trade Policy and Negotiations as well as the State Department's Advisory Committee on International Economic Policy. Um, Scott was the founding chairman of the Department of Commerce's Industry Trade, Trade Advisory Committee, Investment Working Group, and earlier in his career, he was Manufacturing, Marketing, and Government Relations Executive for Procter & Gamble in the United States uh, and uh, Canada. Um, uh, this is uh, what we call, this is a joint um, endeavor by both uh, the Scholl Chair and the Korea Chair uh, and for us, it's part of our Korea Platform Series, and we're very grateful to 
for, uh, to Samsung Electronics America for supporting the Korea platform. Um, we will um, begin the discussion first. What I'd like to do is have uh, each of our distinguished panelists to start out with some opening comments. Uh, and then um, uh, we'll have a little bit of a discussion. Um, I have a few questions I'd like to ask. Um, not that I'm a trade expert, but I think they're, I, can, I can ask questions that don't have to do with North Korea. <laughs> uh, and, then, uh, and then we'll try to, we'll have a discussion with the, uh, with the audience. Um, so uh, Ambassador Ahn, would you like to begin? Right, right. Well, first of all, thank you so much for holding this. Uh, well, Victor, you just called it very timely seminar. Mm -hmm. And I totally agree with you. This is a very timely seminar. Uh, in the sense that we have just declared our interest. Korea has just declared our interest in participating in the TPP. And then where else uh, would, would it be the better place to be holding such a seminar than at the CSIS? So thank you so much. Thank you. And then coming over here, my impression is that, well, uh, Korea, of course, it has declared its interest in TPP. And then are we the new kid on the block? Or are, are we the old kid on the block? I think we are a hybrid in the sense that we are new so far as TPP is concerned. But at the same time, we have been dealing with uh, well, trade and investment wish issues with almost everybody who, is particip who are participating in the TPP for the time being. So, well, hybrid candidate would be the expression. I mean, we are new, but at the same time, we have been dealing with uh, all, 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 almost all of those countries for quite some time, and in a very extensive and intensive manner. So as a hybrid candidate, I should be making uh, about three well, uh, observations. And then the first observation would be, well, uh, Korea has been a very firm believer in the benefits of uh, trade liberalization. And one example would be this, which is that, well, of course, uh, Victor Cha, he has been uh, boring you with uh, many of the things I've been doing before. And one, uh, one of the things I've been doing before was to uh, coordinate Korea's accession to the OECD. So we joined Korea's, uh, we joined OECD back in 1996. One year after that, 1997, then what I came to find was that the OECD as a group was involved in a major, major study which was called Benefits of Trade and Investment Liberalization. And I came to find that OECD was spending so much uh, resources on that particular project. And then I couldn't understand why. So I came to talk to director for international trade at the time, certain uh, Mr. Abel, and I told him, well, the major project you're working on, this benefits of trade and investment liberalization, but hasn't that question be answered already more than sufficiently 200 years ago by Mr. Adam Smith? That was my question, <laughs> and, then, and then he looked at me, and then he said, well, maybe that has been answered at the time, Maybe that is not a big question in your country, in Korea, because you are a firm believer in the benefits of trade liberalization. But somehow that uh, position is being questioned again and again in other parts of the world. So that was the answer. But anyhow, since then, or even before that, Korea has been a firm believer in the benefits of trade liberalization. So that's the first point I wanted to share with you. But the second point I want to share with you is Korea has been not only a firm believer, but also a practitioner of uh, something called competition liberalization. And of course, all of you, many of you would be familiar with this concept of terminology, competition and liberalization. Uh, Wendy would be very familiar with it. I guess the <laughs> author was Mr. Robert Jelly, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. right. And then uh, where competition and liberalization, when I first heard the, heard the terminology, I said to myself, it's like black cat and white cat. That's to say, whether it's black or white, if you catch the, catch the mice, then that's a good cat, right? Mm -hmm. And then what I thought was that what Mr. Robert Zelli was trying to say was, whether it is bilateral, uh, unilateral, or multilateral, if it is good for liberalization, then that is good. That, I thought, was what uh, Mr. Zelli was trying to say. And then, in fact, when I say Korea has been a practitioner of uh, competition and liberalization, we really have been doing it through all different channels. For example, unilaterally, what Korea tried to do was, back in uh, mid-1980s, we started something called five-year tariff reduction plan. So we tried it for five years, and then we had a second five-year tariff reduction plan. So we did it for 10 years. As a result of which, uh, 
the average tariff for Korea, which used to be around 30%, it came down to 8% by uh, mid-1990s. And then we did it without, uh, without any, say, further, further consideration than the fact that we wanted to reduce our tariffs with a firm belief that at the end of the day, it in fact would be, uh, in a sense, strengthening Korea's competitiveness. That was the only reason why we did it uh, unilaterally. And I told you, it, it started by the mid-1980s, and then it uh, was completing by the by mid-1990s. And then mid-1990s, of course, that was the time when Uruguay round was wrapped up, when WTO started. So multilaterally speaking, then the fact that we have been reducing our tariffs for about 10 years, it made it uh, rather easy for us to adapt our system, whole system, to the start of the WTO multilateral system. So we, you have been doing it, we have been doing it unilaterally, you have been doing it multilaterally. And then up until 1998, we were of the view that multilateralism is a far better alternative than bilateralism. So that is the reason why we have been intentionally keeping away from bilateral FTAs. And in fact, back in 1996, when we had that uh, WTO ministerial meeting in Singapore, one of the major issues on our agenda was to how to keep bilateralism at bay. That, in fact, was the major issue for Korean trade policy by the time of uh, WTO ministerial in Singapore in 1996. But after some time, we, can, we uh, came to find that, well, it was not happening. That is to say, even if WTO had started, then somehow there was a proliferation of all those bilateral arrangements. So we had to change our position. So if we cannot beat it, then you join it, right? So we changed our, our trade policy, and by 1998, we began to negotiate our FTAs with large number of trade partners. And by now, we have bilateral FTA with more than 30 countries. So we have been doing it unilaterally, multilaterally, and bilateral, bilaterally as well. But by now, uh, of course, TPP is, is a new effort that we should be joining, and then we are approaching it uh, in the same spirit, that is to say competition and liberalization. So that, that is my second point. My third and last point would be this, which is that in our relationship with the United States, then of course we have a very important partner in every sense of the word for the past 60 years, and then when it comes to international trade, then of course we have Coros FTA behind us, Korea US FTA behind us. And uh, so the third point I should be sharing would be we have been a partner in many different areas. And then in the area of uh, international trade, Coros is there providing a firm basis upon which we can continue to further strengthen this very important economic relations between Korea and then the United States. When he, Think about bilateral relationship, economic relationship between Korea and then the United States. I think we should be looking at three different areas. First of all, trade in goods, trade in services, and investment. And when it comes to trade in goods, several weeks ago, I was in California. And then was speaking to a business council in one of uh, uh, the cities in, uh, in California. And it was a very impressive meeting in the sense that there was an orange girl who said, well, my export of orange to Korea, it increased by 50% last year. And uh, there was another gentleman who said, well, I grow almonds, and my export of almonds to Korea, it increased by 70% in the past year, et cetera, et cetera. So in totality, export of uh, agricultural products from Korea to I'm sorry, from United States to Korea, from the state of California, it increased by 12% last year. And then it is increasing by another 12% this year. So in other words, the products covered under the FTA, they in fact are enjoying this uh, improved market access in a very significant way. Then I was very encouraged about, about that. And then when it comes to trade and services, then of course we have to admit the fact that well, U.S. service providers, you are the most competitive service providers in the whole world. And then when it comes to investment, back in 2005, 2006, interesting thing began to, ha began to happen. That is to say, 
up until that time, there was more investment being made from the United States into Korea. But beginning from 2005 to 2006, the direction changed. In other words, now there is more investment being made from Korea into the United States. So, so, far, as the, uh, so far as the flow of investment is concerned, United States is the net benefiter of uh, investment coming from Korea in, into the United States. And in that context, I should be telling you this, which is that when it comes to trading goods, it is just the goods which cross the border. But when it comes to trading services or when it comes to investment, you need more than that. Uh, in order to promote uh, trading services or investment, what you have to see is movement of capital, movement of technology, as well as move, movement of people. And then uh, when it comes to capital or technology, there is very little barrier for the cross-border movement of capital or technology. But when it comes to professionals, when it comes to the movement of people, then there are barriers. So that is the reason why for the time being, we are working rather hard in order to have uh, more, say, professional visa for Korea so that we would be able to have more professionals to come from Korea to work in the United States, which I think will help uh, for the promotion of uh, trading services as investment between our two countries. So let me try to wrap up. We are a hybrid candidate for the TPP. But at the same time, we have all of this behind us. That's, that's to say we are a firm believer in, uh, in the benefits of trade liberalization. And then we have been a very active practitioner of competition and liberalization. And then, of course, we have been uh, well, benefiting enormously out of our bilateral uh, trade arrangement between Korea and the United States. And then with all of this in our background, I'm pretty sure that we can, uh, we can uh, be a very meaning, meaningful participant in the TPP negotiation as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Wendy. Well, thank you very much. It's, um, first of all, it's, a, it's an honor to be here in your new headquarters. I have to say this morning I was heading over to 1800 G Street <laughs> and then realized that you moved. <laughs> and um, it's really great to be in a panel with three colleagues who I've worked work with throughout my whole career. Um, Victor, I love to tell the story, when he was in the White House and he was working on North Korea issues, I was working on chorus issues, and periodically we would look at each other and, and ask each other, who has the tougher job? <laughs> <laughs> um, Ambassador Ahn and I go way back. Um, we, um, we went to Georgetown um, University together um, many years ago. And since then, um, we have um, worked together both on OECD matters, WTO matters, and bilateral manner, matters. And so it's a real honor, but also a bit of an intimidation to be on the stage with him because I always think that I know a lot about trade. But when I hear Ambassador on, I re always realize I have a lot more to learn. And Scott Miller, um, we go way back um, through working on various issues, both bilateral, multilateral, and regional. So Korea TPP, <laughs> let me make a, offer um, a few remarks to, um, this morning. First of all, I'm just back last night from our meetings um, in Singapore, um, where we um, concluded a very successful TPP meeting at the minister's level. Um, there were four days of intensive discussions among the 12 TPP ministers um, they made excellent progress in terms of really identifying what, what we call in the trade world landing zones on a number of the key outstanding issues. Um, they reaffirmed the commitment of achieving a high level comprehensive agreement, even if that meant taking a little more time to achieve such an agreement. Um, and they agreed to meet um, soon after the new year again. So we are very encouraged um, by the progress made in Singapore. Um, there are clearly some tough issues that still need to be worked out. But even on the tough issues like IPR, environment, and state-owned enterprises, we made um, a good deal of progress. And coming out of that meeting, we feel that they, we have a lot of momentum going forward um, to um, moving towards concluding a high standard ambitious agreement. 
Adding to the momentum is Korea's recent announcement of, it, of its interest in joining TPP. Um, and since then, um, Korea has entered into, con started consultations with a number of TPP partners with respect to its interests. Um, we understand that this issue is under extensive debate in Korea, while Koreans are benefiting, are, are, are debating the benefits um, of, of joining TPP, but also expressing concerns with respect to what more does it have to gain from TPP since it has free trade agreements with a number of the TPP partners. Um, there are a number of concerns being expressed in various sensitive sectors in Korea. Um, and there's also um, a feeling that maybe there's some FTA fatigue in Korea. Um, but for our part, we believe that Korea's expression of interest is something to be welcomed, um, that Korea, um, through the Chorus Agreement, has shown that um, it is prepared to negotiate a high standard and comprehensive agreement, um, and that Korea's addition would really add to the political and strategic weight of TPP as the vehicle to, for regional economic integration and a basis for a free trade area of the Asia Pacific. Um, that said, and I'll get to this shortly, um, through the TPP bilateral consultation process, we will have a number of issues to work through with Korea um, as we um, consider Korea's interest in joining TPP. The first order of business among the 12 TPP countries now is to complete the negotiations which are in the final stage. Um, and there is a process for joining TPP once a candidate country um, announces its interest in joining TPP. Um, first, each country needs to reach its own decision and its own conclusion with Korea or any candidate country um, with regard to its support for that country joining TPP. For the United States, this means that we undertake um, bilateral consultations with the country in close consultation with our Congress um, and with our stakeholders, soliciting input from them and then working through with the candidate country a number of issues. Our consultations um, with potential TPP partners typically are two-tracked. First, we focus on the country's readiness to live up to the high standards of TPP and to um, indicate that it's prepared for the comprehensive tariff coverage of TPP. In addition, we look at um, bilateral issues um, of concern um, that we develop based on extensive um, consultations with our stakeholders and with Congress. With respect to the first aspect, um, as Ambassador Ahn mentioned, you know, Chorus is a gold standard agreement. And in many respects, what we're negotiating in TPP is very similar to Chorus. Um, there are new issues, new chapters like state-owned enterprises, supply chains, small and medium-sized enterprises, um, issues that were not um, fully addressed or addressed at all in um, um, Chorus, and those are issues we'll need to consult with Korea on to make sure that it's ready to um, um, live up to those high standards in those areas. There are also certain areas that were addressed in Chorus, um, but in TPP, we are building on the Chorus commitments. And for example, the issue of the environment comes to mind. That's an area where we had a strong chapter in chorus. Um, there's a strong chapter in environment in chorus. But in TPP, we are looking to go beyond the chorus commitments in that area. In addition, with respect to the bilateral issues of concern, um, this is something, once again, we'll need to work out in close consultation with our um, stakeholders and with Congress. Um, and um, that's something that will take a bit of time. Um, but that said, I thought I would just mention a few issues that were the subject of my recent trip to Seoul, issues that um, are, um, many are tied to chorus implementation um, and issues that are coming up with respect to chorus that will need to be addressed regardless of Korea's interest in the TPP. 
But before I get to these issues, I just want to underscore something that Ambassador Ahn said, um, that overall in Chorus, you know, we've had good implementation of the agreement. We have a huge and growing bilateral trade relationship, and it's only natural that we'll have um, differences and issues to work through with any um, large trading partner like Korea. And through the FTA, we have a lot of committees and um, structures to deal with emerging issues and emerging issues of concern with respect to Chorus. And we have been using the committee process, I think, very effectively to head off um, a number of issues that could become potential irritants um, in our trade relationship. When the vice president was in Korea um, just a few weeks ago, he did underscore the importance of course implementation. And today I would just like to highlight a few issues that we're working with Korea on where we're looking for progress to be made, once again, regardless of Korea's interest in TPP. Um, the first issue I'd like to highlight is the issue of, um, with respect to customs origin verification. Um, this is an issue um, that um, has really been lingering for a while. Um, we had hoped that there would be a technical solution to this issue, but we are, um, grow we are um, our concern with this issue is growing as more and more of U.S. companies are telling us that excessive um, origin verification requirements by Korea um, um, have the potential to undermine a number of the tariff benefits that we negotiated hard for in the agreement. Um, so we look forward to Korea um, quickly um, addressing this issue. Second, on the second anniversary of Chorus, which will be next March 15th, a number of important commitments will come into effect with respect to the financial services chapter dealing with um, data transfer issues. We've made some progress in that area, um, but we are working with Korea to ensure that upon the second anniversary of Chorus, um, that these commitments will be fully implemented. Third, in the automotive sector, we continue to experience um, a number of issues um, with respect to not only the letter of Chorus, but also the spirit of Chorus. Um, as many of you remember, um, this administration um, has placed a high priority on um, um, the health and the, um, the growth of the U.S. automotive industry, and we worked hard with the Koreans to um, agree on additional commitments in the automotive sector in 2010. Um, since that time, there have been a number of issues have surfaced. We've worked through a number of them, but um, the latest issue of concern to our companies deals with the bonus malice system um, that Korea is looking to implement um, in the near future. And finally, um, an issue that's on, on our minds um, but not addressed in chorus is the issue of organics. And specifically, come January 1, um, Korea is set to implement um, a new certification program on trade in organics goods, um, which um, has the potential to disrupt trade from the United States. We are um, seeking to work with Korea on what we call an equivalence agreement, um, which we would then each mutually recognize each other's um, um, certification systems in these areas. We recently create, um, concluded such an agreement with Japan and the EU, so we look forward to concluding such an agreement um, with Korea. Um, and now, then, if I can just move on to TPP. Um, <laughs> but if I can just say, all those issues are really important, and we need to work with Korea to resolve them. As we look to TPP, then, um, we look forward to working with Korea closely um, as we seek to pave the way for their membership in the TPP. We believe that Korea um, is a natural partner for the TPP. It has a lot to offer to the TPP with respect to um, being a country that not only um, agreed to high standards with the United States and our FTA, but in fact, in its negotiations with other countries around the world, both TPP countries and non-TPP countries, 
has been insisting on such high standards with other countries. And so um, we think that's um, very important. And so looking ahead, um, we are hopeful and we look forward to working with Korea in our bilateral TPP consultations to pave the way for their membership in the TPP, um, provided that we have the certainty that high level and comprehensive standards can be adhered to, and also that we can work through the bilateral issues of concern. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Uh, I'll be very brief, as I want to get to your questions and to Victor's questions, which he says he's not a trade guy, but he'll ask some good <laughs> trade questions. Uh, my first reaction when I read the uh, news of, uh, of Korea's interest in joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership was what took so long. It seems a very natural move, and uh, I applaud uh, the government of, uh, of Korea for moving forward. But uh, if you look at this, you look at the existing 12 parties of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, Korea has already concluded free trade agreements with eight of the 12. It's negotiating them with three more, Canada, Mexico, and New Zealand. Uh, and so that leaves only Japan where there's not an, an existing or an ongoing, existing FDA or an ongoing negotiation. So it's a very, so from that standpoint, uh, Korea is a very natural partner to the TPP. Uh, from, from the standpoint of, uh, of, the, of strategy, uh, I think j becoming a member of the Trans-Pacific Partnership is totally consistent with and, and quite logical uh, fit with the uh, Korea strategy of FTAs that they've been implementing very diligently since 2002 or 2003. So this fits strategically. Uh, in terms of, of the benefits of the agreement, the most obvious ones are uh, uh, the market access in Japan. Uh, Japan remains a top five trading partner, both imports and exports for Korea. And uh, with the exception of China, which you're, with Korea is already negotiating a free trade agreement with China, uh, it would be the biggest remaining trading partner on, on which the trade terms were MFN rather than preferential. So there, there's a win there given, given the existing trading relationships. Uh, in terms of the text itself, uh, in terms of the commitments in the text and the obligations in TPP, uh, in my view, uh, our best effort before TPP was the U.S.-Korea free trade agreement, and those, those obligations from 2006 will be improved and modernized, but not particularly burdensome to Korea. So my, my suspicion is this will be a fairly straightforward uh, entry. Now, if, it, if this is such a natural fit, and if there are already these existing free trade agreements, what's the benefit for Korea? Uh, let me pick up on the ambassador's comments, because I think he identified the areas which would be most beneficial to, for Korea's uh, entry with, the, with the, the trans pacific Partnership, and that is services and investment. Uh, if you look at Korea's position in the world, Korea is a big trader, uh, the, interestingly, and a growing trader. Astonishingly so. Uh, Korea's trade, total import and exports and merchandise trade is a little over a trillion dollars. For an economy the size of Korea, that's massive trade. They have a big footprint in trade. And keep in mind, that is a thousand-fold increase in 50 years. You go back to 1965, Korea had a million dollars worth of merchandise trade. It went from a million to a trillion. Very impressive progress, and it has benefited the Korean economy to do so. However, the areas of investment and, uh, and services are both major opportunities. If you look at Korea's investment profile, uh, the Korean economy and Korean uh, firms are major capital exporters, including to destinations like the United States. But Korea attracts the smallest share of in inbound foreign direct investment of any OECD member. So there's an opportunity there, whether it's because of regulation or closed sectors or whatever it might be. Uh, the, there's a major opportunity for Korea to benefit as a recipient of foreign direct investment, not just a capital exporter. Uh, a lot of those opportunities will be in services, and I think if I were a, a, an armchair economist looking at the Korean economy and how to generate growth, the, the thing I would focus on the most is efficiencies in services. Korea has a spectacularly efficient manufacturing sector but services productivity is less than half of manufacturing productivity for Korea. And in fact, total factor productivity in uh, services in Korea are declining. So this is an opportunity both for domestic regulatory reform, 
uh, but also for engagement with world-class service providers uh, in the economies uh, of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So for, for those reasons, I think that despite this appearing to be an easy lift, there's some really beneficial work to be done in services and investment. I'm delighted to see Korea sign up for this because I think the Trans-Pacific Partnership is the place to do the best work in reform for services and investment. Uh, let me close by, by asking a question about next steps. I wouldn't speculate to know what, uh, what the U.S. government has in mind or what the Korean government has in mind. But for me, next steps are a little bit complicated. We probably ought to talk about it today. Uh, there are, it's, a, it's in some ways a binary choice. Does Korea join the Trans-Pacific Partnership before the agreement is concluded or after? And either, either choice is a little complicated, but let me lay out the complications and then stop talking. If, if Korea joins before the TPP is concluded, it ref will reflect a decision among the Trans-Pacific Partnership parties, the current 12 parties, to continue the talks for somewhere between six months and a year. I mean, I'm just basing that on what, what's happened. All right, Mexico and Canada express interest in joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership at Honolulu's APEC meeting in November 2011. All right. the, the first time they sat down at the negotiating table full time was December 2012. It takes time. Japan was a little faster, but not much, okay? Japan expressed interest in March of 2013 and made its first negotiating round in August 2013. And based on the comments made uh, by Ambassador Froman and others, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, remedial work to be done with Japan right at the moment in terms of catching it up to the rest of the negotiations. So uh, w with that said, uh, uh, joining now would mean a, probably just speculating, a late 2014 completion of TPP, which may or may not be acceptable to the parties given, how, uh, given the progress that has been made. The other alternative is for Korea to join after concluding the agreement, in which case the parties that conclude the agreement have to figure out what the accession protocol looks like. I can easily imagine an accession protocol because TPP at some level looks a lot like the WTO, where to, if you want to accede to the WTO, uh, you accept GATT 94, which is the text, and you negotiate schedules on, both, on, on all the uh, products in terms of entry with all the members, and that gets consolidated. Now, WTO is a different animal. It's been handling a session since its creation. Uh, it has a secretariat. TPP doesn't. So there's, there, there are unanswered questions here, but that, that, that's, that's what, that's what comp not only is joining now complicated, joining later is complicated. And uh, with the, I, I've done my usual of identify a problem and not a solution, but perhaps that's a good place for me to stop. Thank you. Victor? Great, thank you, thank you, Scott. Um, so, um, uh, thank you all for um, uh, both concise but very informative uh, presentations. Um, uh, let me start, um, if I could, with um, Ambassador Ron and sort of picking up where Scott left off. And I guess one of the questions is, as Scott put it so eloquently, why did it take so long? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I guess the other question is, um, so how does this pronounced interest in TPP, um, on my left hand? So is uh, uh, so. I guess one question would be why did it take Korea so long? But then the other is, um, uh, given this pronounced interest in TPP, how does this effect reflect on uh, the country's interest in um, the free trade negotiations with China, as well as uh, RCEP? Mm -hmm. Well, why it took so long? What I think. Uh, well, Mr. Miller has just mentioned the fact that out of 12 countries which are participating in the TPP negotiation for the time being, Korea already has an FTA agreement with at least 10 of them. The only two countries with, with which Korea does not have an FTA for the time being is Japan and Mexico. Maybe there is, uh, well, there are a large number of uh, explanations, but at the same time, that may be uh, the single most important uh, explanation about why it took so long for Korea in the sense that well, when, when you have FTA already with 10 of them, 
I think uh, maybe. Uh, and, then, and then, of course, it takes a lot of time and efforts in order to implement them as well. And then, well, of course, uh, Coros FTA, it was such an important FTA for Korea. And then certainly it took us some time uh, and efforts on our part to digest it, to, to implement it in the, in the correct manner. So that would be the single most important reason why it took so long. But what we have uh, done just now is expressed our interest in partic uh, participating in the TPP. So this is uh, somewhere in the middle, in the sense that we are not uh, participating in the negotiation yet. So we have just expressed our interest. But at the same time, I think uh, we, in fact, are beginning to think about what would be the ad additional advantages of uh, participating in the TPP, other than uh, having had the collection of bilateral FTAs. And then one of them would be, again, uh, Mr. Miller was quite correct when he said that, well, when it comes to manufacturing sector, Korean uh, business community, it is already up to certain global standard. But when it comes to services, I think there is still a long way to go. And at the same time, uh, there would be far, far larger number of uh, additional benefits which can accrue from participation in the TPP, like, for example, rules of origin. Wendy has just mentioned about the rules of origin. And then one big advantage of participating in an arrangement like the TPP would be cumulative rules of origin, which would make it far easier for us to benefit from the FTA arrangements. So I think there are many, many, uh, say, uh, economic as well as non-economic reasons why we should be joining the TPP. But as I've just mentioned, uh, we are not, not there yet. We are not uh, there to have the negotiation yet. What impact it will have on uh, our bilateral uh, FTA arrangement with China as well as uh, RCEP? Well, uh, one of the reasons why I, uh, in my uh, opening statement, was mentioning about competition and liberalization, I think it is there in the sense that when there is important, say, uh, uh, activities we are, we are taking in the direction of uh, participating in, in the TPP, then, of course, it will create a new, mo new momentum in Korea's efforts in our negotiation with China as well as with, with the RCEP. So that, I think, would be, uh, would be uh, what would be additional benefits of Korea participating in the TPP. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, Wendy, um, thank you again for your um, uh, presentation, both on Chorus and on TPP. If I could take you to the thousand foot level for a second. And um, we um, um, hosted recently a talk by Susan Rice at Georgetown. And, um, um, and one of the things that struck me in her discussion of TPP, I mean, clearly TPP is a very important part of the pivot. In fact, some would argue it is the pivot and the second term is TPP and uh, um, TPP is the pivot. Um, but one of the things that I thought was very striking about her presentation was in speaking about TPP, she um, both invited and seemed to challenge China uh, to look at this seriously uh, in, in, in the future. And I wonder if you have any comment. I mean, I, I guess, talk to trade folks, it's always been somewhere in the picture as we think about FTAP and all this. But to me, that was a very um, upfront statement, and it struck me. So. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting for um, until recently when you read the press reports about how China was viewing TPP, um, they were quite negative and looked like, you know, the U.S. was trying to dominate this group of 10, 11 countries. Containment. Um, yeah. Okay. Ghost of George Ten. Ten. Okay. <laughs> um, but, you know, that line has changed recently and China's been um, much more um, interested um, in TPP, we have launched um, um, talks with them under which we are updating them on TPP, and TPP does come up um, at all levels when we meet with the Chinese. TPP was always conceived as an open platform agreement um, where um, all countries um, of APEC that were um, prepared to live up to the high standards of the TPP um, um, were welcome to express their interest. And so, you know, the door is open for that. Um, right now, once again, and this gets to, I think, an issue that Scott was raising, 
Our focus now is really concluding this agreement with the 12 countries. Um, we um, are in the final stages. We think we are in um, um, the end game, and particularly coming out of Singapore, um, there's a lot of momentum and a lot of enthusiasm among the 12 towards concluding this agreement very, very soon. Um, so with respect to the timing issue that Scott mentioned, um, I think it will be very, very difficult for any country, including Korea, to join the ongoing negotiations if you just look at the timetable and the clock. Um, because even if we were to um, quickly conclude our bilateral consultations with Korea and other, the other 11 TPP countries could do the same, in the United States, um, we would need to notify our Congress once we were concluded with these negotiations and a quote unquote 90 day clock of consultations with Congress then um, would commence. So if you just look at a calendar, um, it's very difficult to see how any new country could join the ongoing negotiations. Um, that said, we look forward to um, consulting with Korea, working through all of these issues um, and having them you know, join the TPP at the appropriate time. Um, I mentioned that Korea, through CORUS, has already um, achieved high standards of liberalization and obligations. And I would also mention that in our tariff um, schedules with Korea, um, we have um, a comprehensive agreement that um, addresses a lot of um, sensitive sectors for Korea, for the United States, with respect to Korea um, in the agriculture sector, for example, um, we have um, a schedule of commitments that address Korea's sensitivities, um, but also provide for um, comprehensive liberalization, um, sometimes using very long staging periods, but also providing meaningful market access in the interim. So um, I want to just add those comments. The other thing, um, just based on one point that Scott made, just to make clear, um, from his recollection, I think you, you were saying that Japan entered the negotiations very quickly from March to July. In reality, um, Japan also announced its interest in interest towards joining the TPP in Honolulu right. when Canada and Mexico announced. So those consultations actually took longer than they did for um, Canada and Mexico. Thank you. Um, um, well, I mean, I, uh, I take your point about momentum. I clearly, um, uh, Mike Froman's uh, statements yesterday really gave a sense that you guys felt like you were in the final stage, the final push. And, and again, speaking as a former White House staffer, when, I, when, you know, when they've set out that the president's going to be there in, in the spring, it's got to be done by the spring for sure. So, um, but that actually raises uh, a question that I want to ask Scott, having to do with what's going on back here at, at home, and that is the whole question of trade promotion authority, right? We have this strange constitution in which we gave the president the power to negotiate international agreements but not to regulate commerce, and thus we had um, fast track and TP and TPA, what, what is your view of where we stand on trade promotion authority? Can the administration reach an agreement on TPP without TPA? Um, what do you think? Sure. Uh, well, for those of you who aren't trade policy wonks in the audience, uh, since 1974, uh, most presidents have relied on uh, an agreement with Congress that creates expedited procedures for the approval of trade agreements and, inclu and including that they be voted straight up or down without amendment. It used to be called Fast Track uh, since uh, 2001. It's been called Trade Promotion Authority. Uh, but it, it's an agreement bet between the executive and legislative branches which, for which the constitutional authority for trade is divided. Congress has authority to regulate foreign commerce. The executive has authority to regulate treaty or to, to negotiate with foreign governments. So. Uh, uh, it's been a practical uh, solution to a difficult constitutional problem. Uh, it doesn't exist now. Uh, it expired in uh, about the time the Korea, actually within about 15 minutes of the Korea Free Trade Agreement being presented to the Congress. <laughs> somebody was watching the clock, I remember. <laughs> but uh, uh, but it, it, so it's not in existence now. And uh, it, 
TPA is not a foolproof process. Uh, ask anybody from the government of Colombia how, how it can not work, but uh, it's better than having it, having it than not because you face renegotiations uh, pretty decisively with uh, uh, an uncooperative Congress absent the authority. Uh, in terms of the status, uh, I'll start with yesterday's headlines, which is uh, uh, Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, Dave Camp, Michigan, uh, made a very clear statement. He, he said two things. One is, we're ready to go, meaning there's a bill that's been agreed and it's been a long work process with the Senate Finance Committee, uh, that there's a bill that they think does, does, does right uh, and is certainly bipartisan a bill in the Senate. Um, Mr. Uh, Hatch has been working, Senator Hatch has been working very closely with Chairman Baucus. So there's a, there's a work product they're ready to introduce. But the second thing he said is, we can do this quickly if the president engages. And I think that's, the recipe is simply, that it is just that simple, uh, that the authority is available. Uh, this situation reminds me of the year 2000 uh, following the agreement with China to enter the WTO when President Clinton, Democratic president, uh, with a Republican Congress faced the need to change U.S. trade law uh, in a pretty controversial matter called Ch uh, permanent normal trade relations with China. And there was no, no uh, trade promotion authority of fast track at the time, but there was an impressive, extensive legislative initiative by the White House to get it done. And the ultimate, the, the ultimate success was that uh, it was a bipartisan passage in the House, including over 70 House Democrats voting for Russia, or, excuse me, yeah, China PNTR. And the Senate, through some really impressive work with Senate Ledger Affairs and the chairman and, and ranking member of the, of the Finance Committee, the Senate passed a bill that agreed without amendments. Uh, they passed the House bill without amending it, which is really rare. That's essentially practically what you'd get with TPA. Uh, I think it's very important uh, for the, our negotiators to have clear red lines. So I'd like to see TPA in hand now, and certainly sooner than later. Uh, I do think I, I do do not underestimate the challenge associated with getting it uh, in our. But but we've had divided government before. We've done it. We've had dysfunctional government before, and we've done it. So if our divided dysfunctional government can work again, that'd be good for trade. Okay. Um, and um, sorry, Ambassador, if I could just ask you one more question before we go to the audience, and that is, um, um, in the discussions about Korea and TPP, the question came up, or the comment came up about um, how Korea is discussing this domestically. I mean, and there is a degree of um, FTA fatigue a little bit in Korea. I mean, could you comment a little bit on sort of the domestic challenges for your government in terms of um, I mean, it's still early on, but selling TPP to a domestic audience? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, there's the big picture arguments about this is good for reform more broadly and <laughs> regulation and services and industry, but that really doesn't sell domestically. I mean, what are the challenges here? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, one of the things which I have already mentioned was that Korea already has an FTA with the more than 30 countries. And, and then in the process of negotiate, negotiating all those uh, FTAs, bilateral FTAs, then there has been rather, rather clear, uh, say, uh, lineup of, for domestic actors in our domestic consultation. And then the clear lineup was, uh, well, business community, they were mostly behind uh, the idea of uh, have, uh, entering into FTAs. Whereas agricultural sector had far more reservation with respect to entering those FTAs. So I think maybe uh, in, uh, in our domestic consultation about uh, the, uh, discussing about the advantages as well as downsides of joining TPP, I think we are going to see the repetition of the same lineup of uh, voices, uh, well, according to that uh, same, same uh, topography of uh, domestic actors where they stand. But at the same time, I think uh, when it comes to the TPP, uh, as I have, have already mentioned that there is, there is the case of uh, Japan, and then Mexico, and then with respect to Japan, then of course uh, there has been a lot of discussions, and then that lineup uh, has not been as clear as uh, as it has been the case with other FTAs. So that's one additional factor. But uh, all in all, I think there will be broadly, uh, broadly speaking, there will be, it will be a firm support for Korea's uh, accession to the TPP, participation in participation in the TPP. But we are not there yet, so we are we are working for that. And then uh, for us to be there, I think it will be absolutely necessary for us to get uh, 
good consultation with all the countries participating in the TPP, but uh, first of all with the United States. So we really look forward to doing it. In the basic. Me too. Right. <laughs> And in, in Korea could actually be, I mean, if we're talking about in terms of timetable, as Scott mentioned, after um, an agreement's reached, Korea could actually be a model for how, right, other, uh, other countries that dock onto TPP after an agreement is reached. So it'd still be blazing a trail in that sense as well. So. Yeah, well, that's a point which has been raised by, by Mr. Miller and then which has been partly answered by uh, Ambassador Cutler. But the thing is, where we are talking about uh, tier one or tier two, mm -hmm. Well, maybe, uh, may, maybe there could be a status somewhere in between, uh, tier 1.5, but at the same time, I think it is too early. Mm -hmm. There are so many factors which will be, in a sense, uh, affecting Korea's status of joining the TPP. Mm -hmm. So let us just think about the, the uh, overall general direction where we are going, 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 and then let us see how all those uh, related factors play in, and then see how it all plays out at the end of the day. Okay, very good. Well, tier 1.5. So I think we have time for 1.5 questions. <laughs> uh, Tammy. Well, I think a mic is coming to you. Thank you. Thank you. This has just been an outstanding presentation by each of you. Um, I direct my question to Ambassador Cutler. Thank you for the update on TPP and uh, particularly on the chorus implementation. Uh, front, I wanted to ask, thank you for raising the, the several issues that you did and alluding that there might be a few more. Um, we recently had a meeting of our U.S.-Korea Business Council, and we did a stock take on the chorus implementation, and, uh, and we have quite a few companies who would like to raise issues, and I wanted to ask if you could share anything on the process of how we can get our informa uh, information and how we can engage with you. And Ambassador An, we're eager and ready to uh, do the same with your government as well. Thank you. And as I mentioned, um, consultations with both Congress and our stakeholders are um, a key feature of our domestic consultation process with respect to considering Korea or any new candidate's candidacy um, for the TPP. So um, we really look forward to consulting with our stakeholders and Congress um, soon as we um, develop our um, agenda for our consultations with Korea. I think most people know where to find me. <laughs> <laughs> on the plane. Yeah. yeah, right, on the plane, on the plane. Right, yeah. in an airport lounge. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Claude. Claude Barfi of the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, I'd like to go back to a question that, or a variation of a question that Victor Cha uh, asked, and maybe he's the one to answer because it could be a little uh, difficult for the government people, and that is, how do we explain Korea? He talked about it took too long. How do we explain Korea's sudden change of heart? For the last couple of years, if you talk to academics, you talk to ac government people in Korea, I remember talking with Tao Bark a year ago, it was a very hard-nosed look at the economics. They said, look, their point was, you know, we've got all these FTAs, we've got chorus. We don't have to really worry too much about the economic side. What we have to do right now, I remember him saying, uh, publicly as well as privately, we've got to tamp down the China situation. We need that FTA. Uh, my own, uh, this is a question as well as a statement, my own guess would be, that what really has changed this is the deteriorating security and diplomatic situation. And that somewhere at the top of the Korean government, there's this decision that we really ought to seek shelter a bit. And so it's really beyond the economics. Um, well, I'll, I'll let Ambassador, but let me just say that um, I had very similar experience. I mean, um, on the one year anniversary of Chorus, I was actually in Korea for a conference and, and was sitting at a, uh, dinner table with um, um, some very former high-level officials that were quite involved in the chorus negotiations, and I said to them, so one-year anniversary chorus, what's next? TPP, right? And their response was, no, China-Korea FTA. Mm -hmm. uh, and they gave me all the arguments about, you know, the economics of this. So, you know, so there is a shift. I mean, I think if you had to point to one of the reasons, I think, was the one that Scott raised, and that was, that was before Japan. Was, was a part of it. And I, I, when I talk to Korean officials now, I mean, the, you know, TPP, you know, the Korea-Japan FTA negotiations have long since stalled. And, um, and uh, uh, 
when, whenever you raise TPP with Korean trade officials, they were very focused on, once Japan was in, they were very focused on how the United States treated Japan in those negotiations on uh, non-tariff barriers, particularly market access. So I think that could be one reason. But I think certainly the, um, um, the you know, a trade negotiation is never just a trade negotiation. A trade strategy is not just a trade strategy. It's a broader um, geo strategy. And I think for Korea, they see this probably as the most important thing going right now in the region and, um, um, and something from which they can benefit in not just economic terms, but also political and geostrategic. That's Ron. I don't know how you feel about it. Well, TPP started with four, four countries, Singapore, Brunei, New Zealand, and Chile. And then I think the status of TPP uh, drastically changed when United States has decided to be a leading, uh, leading uh, country for that, for that whole process. And I think it, uh, the status of uh, TPP changed again when Canada and Mexico joined, and then when Japan joined. So getting back to your point about why uh, Korea has changed its position, if it is because of the deteriorating security environment, uh, I, I just wonder if I necessarily agree with your assessment of a security environment deteriorating. So that, I think, would not be the def definitive, definitive answer for the, for the uh, change of, uh, change of uh, or improve or advancement of uh, Korea's position on. I wouldn't call it change. I would call it advancement of Korea, uh, Korea's position on the TPP negotiation. But at the same time, the point you have made and then the point which has been uh, well echoed by uh, Victor, which is, well, TPP, uh, where, of course, economics is important, but it is not necessarily economics. I, uh, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Thank you. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, Song Cho Ri with SBS from Korea. Uh, my question is directed to Ambassador Wendy Cutler. Uh, I understand that the United States uh, eased its own uh, restriction on uh, beef trade the beef import uh, in terms of the progress and uh, transatlantic uh, trade negotiations. Uh, do you believe or uh, does the USTR believe that Korea, South Korea, also need to take uh, the measure the U.S. has taken? Uh, as uh, uh, does, do two countries need to work on that issue before uh, Korea joins the TPP negotiations? I guess that's for me. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, beef trade has been a discussion um, between the United States and, and Korea for some time. We have a beef protocol in effect. It's been operating very smoothly. Um, our trade and our exports of beef to Korea have been increasing. Um, and I'd just like to leave it at that. Right. Well, um, Wendy, I know you Very literally. <laughs> you literally just got yeah, off the plane. Do you want to comment? Do you want to comment? No, not at all. all right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, well, Wendy has been judicious enough. Okay. Very good. Okay. Well, I know that Wendy's just gotten off a plane, literally from uh, from Asia. And Ambassador, I want to thank you for taking the time this morning. I'm afraid that's all the time we have. On behalf of Scott Miller, um, the Shoal Chair, and the Korea Chair, thank you for attending. And please give our uh, guests a warm uh, welcome.